Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special lunchtime edition of Northshire Live. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, here as I often am these days with my friend and co-host, David Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont. Um, I have a couple of quick notes before David introduced our guests and we get started today. Um, first of all, you probably noticed as you came as into, you came this, into meeting this meeting that we are, that we are recording this, this afternoon's uh, event for a future broadcast on our YouTube channel. Um, however, you don't need to worry. We are only we have the settings set up so it is only recording those of us who are unmuted and speaking in the lovely yellow boxes. So you will not be recorded for perpetuity on YouTube. Um, in light of that, please use the chat box to ask any questions that you have for our guests today. Um, you can ask your questions at any time during the event. Davith and I will save them up for you and we will pose your questions for you at the end of the event. Um, and then last of all, before Davith introduces our guests and we get started with the event, um, I just wanted to make a note of thanks. Um, it's been a long, hard, weird year and a half in the world of independent bookselling and really independent businesses of all stripes. Um, and Northshire's continued survival is really owed to you. Um, the incredible loyalty and support of our customers in this last stretch of time has meant the world to us and has been what has enabled us to keep our doors open and keep pre prevent presenting events like this one. So thank you so much for that support. It really means the world to us. Without further ado, David, why don't you take things away and introduce our guests today? Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you all for joining us for this very special event. It was my great pleasure to introduce Lucy, Lucy Jones and her book, Losing Eden, our fundamental need for the natural world and its ability to heal body and soul. Educated at University College London, she has written extensively on culture, science, and nature. Her articles have been published on BBC Earth and in the Sunday Times, The Guardian, and The New Statesman. Her first book, Foxes Unearthed, received the Society of Authors Roger Deacon Award. Isabella Tree, author of Wilding, said that Losing Eden is beautifully written, movingly told, and meticulously researched an elegy to the healing power of nature, something we need more than ever in our anxiety-ridden world of ecological loss, a convincing plea for a wilder, richer world. Um, we are very, very lucky to be joined today by Robin Wall Kemmerer, author of the perennial Northshire staff and customer favorite, Braiding Sweetgrass, a New York Times and Washington Post bestseller named by Lit Hub, a best essay collection of the decade, Northshire bookseller Maeve Noonan says she keeps braiding sweet grass at her bedside right next to Yates. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Robin Walkimer and Lucy Jones. Uh, Lucy, why don't you um, start by telling us about um, the book? Um, sure. Thank you very much for having me and it's, um, it's great to see everybody. Um, so Losing Eden is, um, it's a lot of things. I, I suppose perhaps the main one is that it, it's a synthesis of um, the most compelling and interesting um, scientific evidence I could find to um, explore and explain our connection with the natural world. Um, but it's also uh, veers more into kind of esoteric territory, kind of halfway through, um, and uh, it's a it's a it's a book that has taken about kind of eight, nine, ten years, um, and um, yeah, I'm so thrilled to be here and to be in conversation with Robin, um, whose braiding sweetgrass was um, a really important inspiration and beacon throughout the thinking and writing of, um, of Losing Eden. Uh, and I'm, I'm just so honored and thrilled that she is, will be in conversation with me today. Lucy, I am, I am just delighted and excited to talk with you as, as well. I just love this book. You can see how <laughs> many tabs there are in it. You know, as long as, like you, as, as long as I've been thinking about these things, I find something, I learn something new, Lucy, on every single page. And um, I, I just, I, I, 
you are so deserving of all of the rich praise for, for this book. And, you know, one of the things that really struck me in the kinship between us in the way that we think about the world is when in your prologue, you have granny say to her granddaughter, we haven't loved it enough. Um, and that I just really carry that um, in my heart. So, so thank you for, for that message. And, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is you make such a compelling case for the way that our psyches, what to say nothing of our bodies as well, are shaped by landscape and by our interaction with landscape. So to start off, I wondered if you might say a few words about the landscapes that have shaped you. What are, what are, who are the influences from the more than human world that, that brought you to this place? Thank you, Robin. What a lovely question. Um, my mind goes first to Scotland. Um, so, Southwest Scotland is where my mother is from um, and where I spent a lot of my childhood growing up um, on holiday. Um, we, we lived in quite a kind of urban area in England. I, I grew up in a, in a boarding school, so we did have fields and so on, but we weren't, we weren't near kind of wildness or um, much more than human life. But Scotland was where, um, I would go and I would be able to climb trees and um, watch the waves and spend time with lichen and, and moss and birds of prey. Um, and I, in, in the woods around that area of Scotland, I kind of made myself, I think. My imagination could, could, could grow and I could imagine I was in you know, kind of fairy castles or um, I could, my imagination could run right in those landscapes. Um, and I always felt really excited to be there and also very calmed. Um, I was quite a sensitive child and there was something about spending time in nature, which in the rest of nature, which um, I, I always found soothing and so interesting just just endless curiosity. Um, so that landscape is incredibly, incredibly beautiful. Um, we also spent quite a bit of time in the south of France um, because my father was a teacher. We had these long, long holidays and we would go to France and he would, he would drag us out on walks. And at the time I would, you know, kind of curse and be, be really kind of ratty about it. But I'm so glad he did that because it was those walks kind of in, in the hills of the south of France where I think I just, um, my senses were allowed a chance to, to kind of in, interact with other elements, you know, outside the classroom, outside being kind of cooped up in our urban modern lives, being able to smell the pine trees and look for stag beetles um, um, and so and so I was really lucky that I had those opportunities as a child to engage with the rest of nature. Um, we had a garden and I used to collect insects in, in my little little plastic box but then like many people um, quickly in early adolescence the landscapes I was drawn to changed a lot and it wasn't until my mid to late 20s um, during a health crisis that I uh, reconnected with um, the rest of the living world. I had a long dormancy period where those landscapes were kind of, yeah, forgotten to me. Um, and eventually, I think that was one of the elements which wound up, um, I, I wound up quite unwell. Um, and of course, one of the questions in Losing Eden I tried to look at is how, how, this estrangement and disconnection from the natural world that we we are experiencing affects our psyches um, and our minds. Um, you know, we've never been in this kind of psychological environment before of of um, of being most of us living in urban areas so estranged. Mm. 
you know, listening to you talk about your childhood reminds me that for me that some of the most moving writing in the book is, is the reveries of remembering that intense curiosity that one brings to the world when you're surrounded by all these shapes and colors and, and uh, as you say, the fractal geometries of, of nature that soothe as you speak of, but also enliven. And that combination that you speak of, of, of comfort and engagement with, with the other beings is, is so palpable in, in, in your storytelling. One of the um, delights is your story about, you know, watching your baby daughter eat dirt as all <laughs> well-raised children should. <laughs> and then you're um, telling us about how the microbes in the soil, in the humus, um, actually change our, the biochemistry of our brains. You're, would you tell us just a little bit more about, is it Mycobacterium vacae? Vase? Uh, I just thought that was a, a really enthralling uh, story. So could you, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So this, um, this kind of blew my mind a little bit and um, I think the fact it blew my mind maybe also um, is is testament you know to to our, our dis disconnection my my disconnection my lack of knowing really which started the journey of writing these in Eden but um, so we, we moved out of London into a house in the countryside in in, in a town in England um, I, I had a baby, became a mum, and I noticed that my little daughter would um, just want to eat soil all the time. And at the same time, I started gardening for the for the first time in, in in my adult life, and I had such a buzz afterwards from kind of having my hands deep in the soil. Um, and I wondered whether it was something to do with the magic of growing, or you know, the beauty of of of, of a seed becoming a vegetable um, or just simply being outside. But then I saw on, um, I think a Facebook parenting group, a post about um, uh, microbacteria in the soil having antidepressant like effects. Um, and my initial thought was, was quite skeptical and cynical. I thought that sounds pretty unlikely, um, <laughs> which I mean, I, I, I admit to that now. I mean, I, would, I don't think I would think that now. I think I was in a, in a slightly different mindset kind of eight years ago. Um, and you know, now I realize how, how as much as I love science and that's a prism that I'm very interested in understanding the world that it, it doesn't have all the answers. Anyway, that's an aside. So um, I started uh, researching this this microbacteria M. vacci, um, as you say, Robin, um, and I spoke to a couple of the microbiologists who studied it, um, and it was it was looked at in earnest by an oncologist called Mary O'Brien, who worked at the Royal Marsden in England, um, and she wondered whether this particular bacteria might um, might uh, prolong the lives of her cancer patients. Um, so she, I think she actually gave it to them in, in sandwiches. She gave them like M. Vaki sandwiches. It didn't prolong the lives, but it did uh, seem to make them happier uh, and increase their, their quality of life. Um, and then a couple of scientists built on this work uh, and, and essentially found that this, this M. Vaki can uh, activate uh, boost serotonin in the brain and have antidepressant like effects um, in animal studies but also now uh, it's being looked at in 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 treatment for PTSD uh, and and other psychiatric disorders um, so I spoke to I spoke to one of the leading guys and and he also told me that the the half um, that the half-life of Mvaki is actually really long. It's about three weeks. So if you ingest um, this bacteria while you're gardening, with you your hands in the soil, you, your, your buzz might last for, for, you know, through the weekend into the following week. Um, and I think what I found really quite awesome about that as well is how you know, that's one 
one bacteria in the soil that we know of the one bacteria that you know has been empirically proved proven to have those antidepressant like effects but imagine what what else may be in there what else you know we might be we might not know about we might be missing from having much more limited exposure to these to these tiny other beings that we have evolved alongside you know, our old friends as they're called that's one of the power i think of the writing in losing eden is it it draws on the truths both of the phenomena of our own experience as you said of feeling good um, after having your hands in the earth and thinking about all of the holistic reasons why that might be true but in the western scientific way of thinking we all we look for mechanism right we think well what that's what really will validate this knowledge for us is if we can find a a biochemical mechanism and so I, I really admire your fidelity to both of those ways of knowing, of celebrating the phenomena and as well as bringing us the, the mechanism in the cases where it's known, um, makes for a powerful combination. Thank you. In, in reading Losing Eden, there were so many places where I just really smiled about language, Lucy. And there are places where your, um, your playfulness and your inventiveness with, with, with language just were lovely. I wrote a couple of them down here because I love them so much. Your phrase is like, it, it was a summer which was jam slicked and wasp studded. I thought, oh yes, it, that's so um, evocative of, 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 of summer. And throughout the book, I find that inventive prose, both um, really um, transporting and points to the deficiency of our English vocabulary in describing the natural world and language and the, the need for new words. You, you, you invoke um, Albrecht's solastalgia, um, that sad word, an endling. You bring us new words that point to um, the fact that we need new words to enliven our relationship with, with the living world. Could you say a little bit more about how you see um, the relationship between language and our relationship to to the land? Mm, yeah, thank you. What a great question. Um, and of course, Robin, you have given us so much language and so many words. And I really, um, the phrase species loneliness that, that you have written about, I think is very um, evocative and, and, and resonates a lot. Um, I think one of the one of the words that I find really problematic, which um, I try not to use, but it, it's impossible not to. It, it's, it's just nature, um, you know, and and it's shorthand, isn't it, for 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 the rest of nature. But in a way, it cements our our separation and and our sense, um, you know, that that we are we we are here and nature is there, and um, and particularly in in England, where where I live and and where I'm speaking from, that nature is. Um, something quite kind of romantic with a capital R um, and and pretty and twee and something you go and visit and look at, not something you touch or or smell. Um, uh, and, you know, nature, it, it's, it, it feels like a very constricting and um, boxing um, and kind of, like the opposite of vivifying you know the opposite of what life is um i'm so I'm trying at the moment to, to use the word life in, instead of nature um and to use and to use the living world um as well um uh we have a lot of really awful terms in over here for uh well environmental descriptions um there's a lot of talk about natural capital um, I'm not sure of, uh, if you have that in the States, but this idea of kind of measuring the economic value of, of the land and um, you know, the more than human world. Um, we have a lot of acronyms, um, but I think, you know, which don't do anything to communicate the, 
the wonder and awe of of these places so we have one that's sssi which is site of you know scientific um interest and um the beginning of losing eden started with my um going into one of these sssis and it was filled with um herons and kestrels and water voles and well when i say filled i occasionally heard a plop of a water fill well but you know sometimes that, that's all you can get um but it was kind of buzzing and humming with life this marshland in london um you know busy busy urban london then you'd go into this gorgeous open space and it's called an sssi and it just did nothing to to express to express the the magic and delight there um but even you know the environment um it's so easy to say the environment and and think that it's not our environment and um you know it's something something separate from us i feel that the language that we currently have about our home um our planet is just so it's, it's just so separating um and uh we need to rip it up and start again um find new words and and as you mentioned glenn albrecht is is doing really good work um with that there's a philosopher called Ginny batson in in england who who's coining neologisms um but i think yeah we need more nature just doesn't cut it does it robin mm -hmm. or ssis how clinical is that you know i immediately think what we need is SOWs, sites of wonder, <laughs> um, sites of awe um, that that bring us, you know, to that place of humility, not of alienation. Um, yeah, what a good project to think about. How do we to speak of the living world, and how do we reenchant our our our, our relationships? Um, you wisely i think invoke the language of um our mutual friend bob pyle um who writes so eloquently about the many losses that that we face with biodiversity loss and climate peril as the extinction of experience right um and that that is one of the most fundamental losses that goes along with with loss of bio, biodiversity. And just yesterday, I was out on the trail and happened on this beautiful spring bubbling up out of the hillside. And I thought of all of the risks and how often we're said, you know, really, no, you shouldn't be drinking in the woods. But I thought the experience of drinking wild water is more important to me than anything. And I want to resist that extinction of experience and i wondered for you for you and for you as a mom you know are there experiences that that you so treasure and want for your for your children um that that you know you really hold close to your heart what are what are some of those experiences that you refuse to let go extinct what a great question um well, I think one, the main one that springs to mind is, is water based as well. And it's swimming in the rivers in, in England. And I live in Hampshire, which is a county um, which has lots of chalk streams, um, which is one of, it's one of the only, I think, if not the only place in the world which has chalk streams. And they're, they're very clear, um, they're, often um filled filled with trout that's kind of one of the one of the species um that lives in it but um there are two reasons why the experience of swimming in rivers at the moment is threatened um one is because 97 percent of rivers in in england are privately owned um so because of laws of trespass we're not allowed to to paddle in rivers or, or, or be in rivers because they're um, privately owned and often leased to angling clubs. Um, mm. So I was in my favourite river a couple of years ago and 
it, it was a river that had become really important to me at, um, during a period of, of mental ill health. And we were, we were told to move on and, and, and leave the river. And um, I, can't, I had no idea at that point how little access actually um, in England we are we we have to the to the land and to the rivers um, and the second reason is is pollution our rivers are so polluted um, the rivers near me the river Loddon is so beautiful it's filled with them um, there's so many damselflies demoiselles and and water mint it's just it's kind of got poplars and and moths and and butterflies and you wouldn't think it to look at it but you know, it felt it fails all the tests and it's full of agricultural runoff and and sewage and so on and actually you know they're all pretty much deemed unsafe to swim in so when we go to the river which we do a lot um even though we're, we're not quite supposed to we take a risk um we keep our mouths closed when we if we swim um but it's not an experience that i'm willing to to go ex to go extinct for me because I find it extremely important for my sanity but also for my children I think all children should have the chance to paddle in rivers and to look at minnows and to smell water mint um, and to learn how to kind of tread carefully in, in different environments and um, it, we're, you know, we're quite a river nation over here it, you know, it's quite it's quite culturally important rivers um, but they're so they're so out of bounds for us at, at, at the moment, unless you you trespass, which often feels quite quite intimidating. So so that's one. Um, and then I suppose it's also um, well, I'm not willing for um, just the and you write so beautifully about this Robin just the, the sense of kind of radical noticing and the slowing down the actual experience of going to the woods with no objective or you know not looking for anything particular not achieving anything just being there um that feels sometimes you know quite countercultural as a thing to do i mean often often have to push past the idea that we you know, we should be working and we should be being productive and you know it's kind of a self indulgence to spend all day in the woods but i don't i don't deep down believe that i think that's just kind of societal messaging and so i'm i i i want to you know push back against the idea that my children should be um you know achieving and learning all the time or learning not learning through experience direct experience you know the direct experience of seeing if a bumblebee will crawl onto a hand or you know watching spending the time watching a spider weave a web you know and, and saying that that is not a waste of time you know, that is celebrating being alive and and watching you know that the absolute magnificent wonder of of our planet um, so I suppose that is more broadly as an inexperience I, I am not willing to let go of. How important this is, you know, we could go on and name those experiences, right, that we are not willing to let go extinct. And if we all did that, if we took inventory of, of those experiences which we cherish, um, that's such an important and radical act to say, not on my watch, are children not going to be able to swim or, 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 to, or to pet bumblebees? Um, and I think that is, is our responsibility, right? In return um, for, these, for these gifts to say, no, uh, I dedicate myself to, to the um, continuity of, of those experiences. You were just mentioning in your response these societal pressures that, that shape us perhaps today more powerfully than the landscape chain shapes us, right? Or as, as powerfully depending on our, on our circumstances. And in 
one of your chapters, you talk about, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, it was such a wonderful um, sentence. You were talking about, of course, children's exposure to nature and that mind blowing um, statistic that most children in the UK, and I suspect it's true here in the States, spend less time outside than incarcerated people are required to have. I Oh, that's just been sitting on my shoulders, Lucy. Yeah. Wow. Um, but out of that, you talk about your, your, your daughter's innate desires to be outside as we remember from childhood and hopefully all children have that, that opportunity. And you said their desire to be outside hasn't been distracted or influenced or cultured or educated out of her. And in that list of distracted, influenced, cultured, or educated out of her, um, I really would love to hear your thoughts about the forces that quell our innate um, biophilia. Are they, for the most part in your thinking, unintended consequences? Or in fact, are they deliberate attempts of a necessary kind of education and alienation from nature that, that, that serves objectives that are being imposed on us. So uh, sort of just open-ended, is it, is it distraction? Is it education? Is it culture? What are the influences that are, that are corrupting our innate biophilia? Mm, great question. Thank you. Um, I think it's a real mix of um, unintentional, unintentional, um, structural, uh, systemic. Um, I suppose, I suppose, kind of broadly, as a, as a kind of culture in the industrialized global north, we have forgotten that we're part of nature and we are living at a time of unprecedented disconnection and our eyes are um, distracted from of the, the prize of, of, of earth and, and the gifts that we have. So that is automatically gonna kind of travel down. But I think there are really kind of pernicious um, influences too, such as, um, well, the dominance of cars, for example, in urban areas. So we all often talk about how screen time is keeping children indoors um, and is, is the kind of you know, big force that's stopping stopping kids going outside and to play. Um, but you look at our urban areas. I, I live in a town, and you know, for decades now, children have been, it's been unsafe for a child to go out of a house on their own and explore. You know, we've designed our um, environments uh, in keeping with kind of the dominance of the car and 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 the the ability of for children just to roam around. Mo the majority of children has diminished and ha has winnowed you know it's it's not safe um i don't know what it's like in the states but it, certainly in england we have a real issue with um um insect phobia uh mm. and and kind of fear of spiders and um and in in, in some interviews i've done in the last year or so it, it appears from educators and, and teachers and people who are trying to reconnect kids with the land and, and the rest of nature, that this, this fear of insects is no small thing. It's really, um, uh, it's really influential and, and it really stops kids from wanting to go outside. Um, you know, this idea that spiders are kind of, obviously there are some people who have genuine arachnophobia and, and in certain countries you must be very, very careful um, to you know to, to scare a spider but in England we, we don't have any any insects that can really cause harm but we have this really deep-seated um kind of strains fear or re revulsion um against against insects and I think that that stops kids wanting to go outside um and um the curriculum doesn't um doesn't make space for the direct experience of, you know, watching, going out and, and kind of 
witnessing photosynthesis or um, listening to crickets in the summer or um, you know, listening out for a water bowl in a, a river. You don't get that in, in the curriculum. It's very, you know, coop, everyone's cooped up in their classrooms. Um, I think it's 12,000 hours of classroom time over the, the course of, of school. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of factors. Um, and of course there are massive systemic and structural barriers as well. Um, we know that affluent areas in, are more likely to have uh, higher, I hate this phrase, Robin, but you know, it's in all the literature, high quality green space. Um, you know, more um, beautiful parks, more, more biodiversity and, and um, rather than, you know, a kind of concrete playground or something. So, so in, our, in our socially unequal uh, societies, you know, we have um, disadvantaged communities, people of colour, um, uh, lower socioeconomic brackets having less ability to to know and to, to find that kinship with with the rest of the living world, um, uh, and I, I think that that social inequality angle is is really really crucial. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 troubling to think of the way that that this connects to the economies that that we choose. You know, children who who, who don't have that kind of free thought and experience of wonder in the living world, but are regimented in 12,000 hours in the, in, in the classroom, in a sense, become really well suited for an industrial economy, don't they? Um, to work as cogs in, a, in an industrial economy without complaint, um, quelling their own biophilia and therefore their own wellness as you make the case so, so strongly. Um, and that inevitably, you know, leads us to thinking when we do engage with, with accepting and understanding the losses and the impoverishment of our lives because of lack of connection to, to other living beings, it, it does bring us to, um, to ecological grief. And you have such a powerful chapter on, on, on the nature of, of grief. And so often we want to turn our backs on that. It's, it hurts, right? It really is heartbreaking to uh, acknowledge what's happening um, all about us. But you make the really important statement that we have to feel it, that we have to be, as you said, galvanized by our ecological grief. And I wonder if you would share a bit of, of what does that mean to be galvanized by, by grief, not to turn our backs on it, but in a sense to embrace it and use it. Mm. That's a great question. It's something I'm still trying to figure out um, every day, really trying to figure out how to um, stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway says. And um, how to balance the kind of anger and and um, the sadness with this and also a sense of kind of you know personal culpability you know living in the, the systems that destroy um, uh, my personal um, uh, response I think that I found really helpful um, antidote to ecological grief and um, to the forces that continue to destroy, even though we know um, we know you know where we're at, um, is to to do what I can locally. Um, so kind of be involved hyper locally in. Um, uh, I'm rewilding a, a small field behind my house with my neighbors and it's it's barely an acre um, but we let it we asked the council if we could let it grow um, it was it was previously kind of amenity grass so it was just like a shorn lawn of course there was life underneath um, and we asked for permission 
to restore it and to just let it thrive, make it as species rich and biodiverse as possible. And come the end of May or early June this year, it had become this incredible buzzing, humming meadow. A stone's throw from an enormous shopping mall, you know, a big road, I live on a big road, and I'd walk out there in the evenings and my feet would kind of pinball um, grasshoppers and crickets and there were myriad species of beautiful grasses, sedges, rushes, Yorkshire fog, which is a grass which can support kind of 60 to 70 invertebrates, um, butterflies, moths, flowers, wildflowers. And it was so, um, it was just such a lesson in how uh, quickly things can recover and how just by stepping back, um, the, the earth can regenerate and recover. And it's all kind of there dormant waiting for us to decenter ourselves. Um, so, so that experience and we, well, what happened was not great. The mowers came in and they mowed the whole thing the following week and it was tragic and, and heartbreaking and devastating and, and we're working on it with the council that this won't happen next year. Um, and we, it was an example of solastalgia like Glenn Albrecht talks about, you know, we'd come to love this place. Um, but I find that um, all I can do is these small, these small actions to try and um, defend or just speak up for the other beings. It was interesting the process in um, talking to 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 our councillors and our council about this space and how it being in the the public interest is so the overriding thing in, in all of our planning and housing and design has to be in the public interest you know and there's so little space um in this in this country where it, it's almost it people can't even conceive of of why you would leave a field to grow up you know because people see ragwort or nettles or brambles as as weeds or um you know scrubland but in fact they're as you know very important plants in themselves and, and food for, for other beings and so it I feel like just just a, being a voice to try and um, try and allow life to thrive is is all I is what I can do. Yeah. And that's a powerful thing um, to carry that message that nature needn't be out there, you know, it's next to a shopping mall waiting for us to give it a chance to research um, and and to be that voice that when someone says, you know, well, it's got to serve the public good. How does a field of weeds serve a, pu a public good? You know, I think one of the powers of losing Eden is that you unify the public good and the good of the more than human persons as well. You know, that all the pollinators and the birds and the seeds and the seedlings and all of them are all benefiting by that meadow but so too does the mental health of the people who are around it. It tells us these things are not in opposition, are they? they they're the same thing. What's good for land is good for people. Um, and exactly. you, you make that case so beautifully. You know, I know I have time for just one tiny more question. And you know what? I'd love to ask you on behalf of all of us who sometimes feel out of balance, um, how is it that, that you create space and time for your minimum daily requirement of health giving uh, nature? How do you do it? Um, well, I, I think these days, um, and it's kind of, it's kind of sad in a way that I needed to spend years researching it to get to the point where I could allow myself, you know, and, 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 and see that I needed nature so much for my sanity. I, I, I see it. I see communing and kind of finding a kinship with the land and, and other beings 
as as important as sleeping or eating or um you know spending time with my loved ones um it's not uh it's it it's not something i can i can ever do without um so so a lot of the making space is quietening you know the voice that says do clean the house you know do your emails etc um no i have to i have to go out there um and you know sometimes my husband will say you need to go out there <laughs> you know I, I i need it for my um for my my sanity um and um the nearest uh kind of nat natural area to my house is a cemetery um it's about a five minute walk and um you know you might see it and and think it's nothing special um it's an old cemetery so it has some really old trees but it you know from from maybe kind of first impressions you might think oh it's just a kind of old cemetery but um by spending time there often often daily um over the last five or so years um it has become a kind of like a rainforest to me um you know i go out there with my hand lens and i look in the the moss as i have learned to do from you robin and i look at the lichen on on my moss and lichen wall and i have a favorite tree my beech tree which i sit underneath and um you know i met i even though I, I'm not a stone's throw from a forest or the sea or anything like that, I I'm, I'm live very urban, but the, this cemetery through daily kind of noticing, spending time there, getting to know it, um, has become, you know, the equivalent of, of a wilderness or a jungle. And so kind of that, that the transcendent ordinary, as, as you said the other day, Robin, you know, finding that has allowed me to make space for something more than you know, just a pot plant nearby um yeah beautiful mm. Lucy, well thank you so, so much robin and lucy um this has been just a wonderful conversation um our first question here is from eric he says i think this is from when you were growing up lucy did you have any animal companions or pets and did you have any influence and did they have any influence on your sense of nature growing up that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had hamsters, rabbits, guinea pigs, um, those those types of um, of smaller smaller pets. I always longed for a dog, um, but I loved I loved my my guinea pigs and rabbits and hamsters. Um, I also had stick insects, and um, I would collect kind of ladybirds and sell them from the garden. Um, I think that, that it's influenced my sense of nature in in a way of um I just love all animals I just love other all creatures um and I suppose it looking after uh, after a pet helps you know kind of how to what they need and and, and to care for them um um and I mean obviously that it's a bit different I think a, a kind of a domesticated animal to a wild animal of course um but i suppose that i think the tactility of of you know being a child and, and stroking a rabbit it's i remember that and i think that's an important that's a really nice a, a good experience but i've always been very um i was always reading kind of animal books and um and yeah my i have young children and we don't we don't have any any pets yet um uh, but I'm looking forward to hopefully one day. Um, saying that, I um, we we had a tortoise once who unfortunately came to a sad end, and I have changed my views on on keeping animals like tortoises. I I felt quite sad for our tortoise living in uh, a town actually, so I'm, I think I'll think quite carefully about pets going forward. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very, a very thoughtful answer. Um, Jen asks a lovely question asking, is there any exploration of why some kids fear being in the wild and some kids don't? And how can you cultivate that lack of fear of the outdoors and the unknown in children? 
I just, I didn't hear the first part of that. Can you just repeat that one? Of course. Um, is there any exploration of why some kids fear being in the wild versus kids who don't have that fear? Mm. Um, from my from my kind of reading and, and, and research, I think that there's a sense that if you're if you're kind of exposed to the natural world or you're given opportunities to to know to know other creatures and to be outside from a young age um we know there is evidence to suggest that if you if you have those experiences as a child you're more likely to go on through childhood and into adulthood and have a relationship with the rest of nature so i don't know any specific evidence about kind of fear of the wild but I would instinctively say that um, you know, the, a key reason would be whether they'd been children had been allowed those opportunities. Um, I know that uh, I've recently written a book about children and nature with a, a a great guy called Ken who does forest school in um, in a in a cemetery park in East London, um, and some of the children who go to to the cemetery park for for their forest school. Um, they often will only kind of leave their house going from school to ho home to school, school to home. Um, and he's, he talks about how when they enter the park, um, which is a very wild overgrown cemetery with kind of tree roots and um, it's actually frightening for some of them to walk on a surface that isn't just tarmac or concrete. It's actually frightening to walk you know, on tree roots for the for these children, um, because they haven't had that experience, um, and you know, and that's obviously not a wilderness, but you know, for for these extremely urbanized kids, that that is a kind of wilderness um, experience. Um, so, I know that what we call forest school in England um, is really uh, is really effective at kind of breaking down those fears and. and giving kids the chance to kind of um, take risks and to feel more comfortable in the natural environment that they may not have had the chance had the chance to experience. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about what forest school is? Because it's not something I at least have, have heard of before. Sure. So this is one of the um, this is one of the uh movements that I, I got a lot of hope I felt a lot of hope in as I was reading Musing Eden um and it's a kind of it's a grassroots um movement that's been that was started in England maybe in the 80s and, and has since kind of spread um in, in fact it started in Scandinavia uh and it it means kind of taking children into into a forest or woodland or natural environment um and giving them a chance to kind of play, make fires, um, um, learn about the other creatures uh, around them, take risks, um, be outside. It, it's essentially a kind of pushback against the cooping up of, of, of children inside. And so now um, in the UK, primary schools will um, go and do forest school. It's not like there is a forest school, it's, it's kind of, they'll go and do a session of forest school um you know like once a week a class will go and often that will be the only chance that um you know a, a, a child might have to have that slightly wilder play experience um and it's definitely not um kind of invested in enough by government and there are barriers um to it as well but there is you know you can see it that there are there are parents and teachers and educators are saying Kids need the wild. Thanks so much. We have time for very much only about one more question, and it is from Lauren. Uh, she says, as speaking as someone who has moved around a lot in her life and never really found a place to call home, it's so interesting what the outdoor world can provide in terms of benefits for mental well-being and a sense of belonging. Something that she loved reading about in Losing Eating Eden. 
Um, she says, it feels almost like one constant that can be found across different places in nature and the, is, is nature and the outdoors that can bring us connection, allowing people to defense, develop a sense of belonging or calm. And she would love if both of you could conclude by speaking a little bit about that sense of belonging at home. Sure, Robin, do you want to go first? Oh, um, yeah, um, I think it's a really more uh, an observation even than a question that I really honor that um, coming to know the natural world around you wherever you are is a kind of homecoming because it helps you learn how to create relationships with, with the land around you and the beings who are around you. Um, to, to not only know them, but to be known by them. And um, so that, that practice of making a home is, um, I think, invaluable. And you know what, it, it actually reminds me about the that homemaking notion is that the very roots of the word ecology are in home. You know, the word ecology from oikos means, you know, the study of home and, and through the, in a sense, the engaged study of home, we also make a home. Um, that's beautiful. I, I think maybe we should, maybe instead of using the word nature, we should use the word home because, um, you know, it's, it was, we call it nature now, but it was our home for, you know, 99% of our evolutionary history. Um, I, thank you, Lauren, I really, um, really resonates with me and your, your, your point is a, a beautiful one. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd like to mention the, the evolutionary, angle I think is one that we forget you know that I got into this because I used to go up to my cemetery nearby and I'd go under this tree and I would just immediately relax and I was interested in the shape of the tree and what was going on with this one tree which had this look large kind of spreading canopy and these small leaves and I was thinking about you know, do we have a genetic predisposition to prefer particular trees or what's going on? So um, I found that through the work of Gordon Orion's, we, even to this, to this day, we do have this preference for a particular shape of tree found on the savanna, um, like the acacia tortillas, I think it is. Um, and when I used to walk under, when I walk under the tree, even today, I, I do feel a sense of kind of being at home, um, you know, and at the time I think, is this, where am I going, you know, being a little kind of kooky here, um, but this idea um, that we have this genetic preference for, for, for tree shape and, and for landscape, um, particular landscapes with prospect and refuge and a bit of water um, is replicated in studies, you know, that we, that we still, even you know, in 2021, when we think we're so modern and we're so like technologically advanced, and um, we're it's not you know it's not like we stepped off a train and we're here. Um, and Jung talks really beautifully about this. You know, we we have these primitive layers in us. Um, you know, the cellular genetic kind of layering um, of of us living. In our home, in in nature, with these with these trees, with these other beings. So, um, I guess that that's something that I feel quite strongly, um, and I love that that comment. And Robin, thank you so much for your amazing questions and for your your work. Um, it's been such an honour to be in conversation with you. A real amazing honour for me. Robin, Lucy, thank you both so much. This has been a wonderful. Um, intriguing and stimulating, thoughtful event. Um, thank you both so much. The book is Losing Eden. You can order it uh, if you have not already at northshire.com. The link is in the chat. Um, have a great day uh, and evening, Lucy, for, in England. And um, take care, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.